Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So today I am back to talk about the books that I read in the second half of September. I feel like this second half has been really quite a productive reading time. I feel like I've got uh, quite a few things under my belt, uh, a few different kind of books. Um, and yeah, I feel like I'm getting back into the swing of reading, which is really nice. I'm going to start as normal, uh, trying to quickly get through some books that I want to do justice on in longer form videos. First off, we have Ethelstan by Tom Holland. This is the first book in the Penguin Monarch series, which I have mentioned a few times that I'm really wanting to make a video series on. So expect a video on Ethelstan coming soon. But to quickly summarise, I was really, really surprised at how much I did end up enjoying this, considering that like pre-conquest history is not really my typical read. Like Anglo-Saxons and Vikings are not really my bag at all. Um, I didn't learn anything about them at all during like primary and secondary school and I touched upon them like quite briefly at university. Um, so it's not really my thing. However, I found this really quite engaging and I don't necessarily think that it was due to the actual facts of what happened and I don't think that it was a particularly like dynamic or like beautifully written historical account and biography um, but I just found it interesting for some reason. Being able to see this as kind of like the origin story of what would later become Britain and being able to see the ways in which Ethelstan's reign and his success was in a lot of ways due to himself but also due to being in the right place at the right time and, and also there being a lot of historical precedent for the things and the ideas that he was trying to accomplish. I feel like Ethelstan is a figure that um, is largely ignored outside of like the history loving circles so I definitely recommend picking this up and seeing what you think. The other book that I would like to do a longer form review on is The Outcasts of Time by Ian Mortimer. Ian Mortimer is probably most well known for his popular history series The Time Traveller's Guides, particularly The Time Traveller's Guide to Medieval England I think is the most popular of his his books. And I feel like Outcasts of Time is really just a mix of all of his books coming together into historical fiction. The Outcasts of Time follows two brothers, William and John, who are living in 1348 as the Black Death has descended on Britain. They end up contracting the disease and realise that they only have a few days left to live when they are approached by this mysterious voice which gives them a choice. They can either spend their remaining six days in 1348, giving them the opportunity to say goodbye to their families, or they can take their chances on the future, where each day they will be transported 99 years into the future. So day one they land in 1447, day two they land in 1546, day three they land in 1645, day four they land in 1744, day five they land in 1483, and then finally day six, the final day, they will land in 1942. Whew! <laughs> And it's really the story of how they struggle to adapt with these massive, massive changes in their societies every day that goes by. This is a book that I have not heard anybody talking about on booktube and I don't know necessarily how popular it was when it came out, but the concept really, really intrigued me. I mean, just the premise alone, at least to me, sounds really, really interesting. And I was really pleased that I did actually quite enjoy it. However, it is a book that I wouldn't necessarily say everyone must go out and read. As you would kind of expect from a historical fiction book like this, where they are having to learn as much information as humanly possible about the new time period that they are in, uh, there are moments where it does get a little bit info dumpy, which I know is not going to appeal to everybody. At the same time, I'm also recognising how it's kind of a bit crucial for there to be some info dumping happening that maybe feels unnatural to you to read, but in terms of actually getting the story across and having these two characters understand the world that they are living in, it's necessary. And I felt a lot of the time whilst listening to this, because I listened to it an audiobook, um, that Ian Mortimer was really trying to balance how much information is enough and how much is too little. So I feel like there are some people who might complain about that. I feel also that there are going to be some history fans who read this who maybe think that he didn't throw in enough information about the time periods. That maybe some people will be reading different periods expecting like certain information bombs to drop, which never do. I felt particularly during the 1546 period, like there were certain bombs about the Tudor dynasty that I thought were going to be dropped and never actually happened. Happened. However, because I listened to it on audiobook, I feel like those info dumpy sections were not quite as egregious as maybe they might have been to read. I felt like because I was listening to it, I was able to immerse myself in the world a lot better, whereas I feel like I might have maybe scanned pages at some points if I was reading it physically on the page. However, despite saying that and knowing that there are going to be some people who do not really respond to this, I found it a really interesting book. As a history fan, I found some of the themes and concepts that Ian Mortimer was trying to um, explore 
with this story really really interesting particularly on like what makes a good act uh, why do we study history what use is it to us in our present day I feel like this would be a very very good book to kind of thrust into the hands of people who think that you know like prior to the industrial revolution and the enlightenment that the past was all like this one monotonous sludge I would just kind of throw this book at them and say hey things were happening, developments were happening in these previous centuries. It was also quite interesting to read uh, the 1348 Black Death uh, chapters whilst we are currently living through a pandemic. Um, I found it fine but maybe if you are not very comfortable with reading that right now, I completely understand. Because this book really does not shy away from like the suffering and the gore and just the societal impact, um, especially on your mentality and feeling very distrustful and not knowing who to turn to, um, which I think might be jarring to some readers right now. I feel like a good summary of this book would be saying it's kind of like a history of Britain meets it's a wonderful life and see how that appeals to you. <laughs> Next up I read Silver Sparrow by Tiari Jones who is the author of An American Marriage which I read earlier last year and really really enjoyed. This was a really interesting book about a family in which the father is a bigamist and has two families. However the dynamic is kind of different because one of the families knows that they are a second family and the other does not. And we bat between the perspectives of the two daughters of this man Dana who is the daughter of the second wife Gwen who know that they are a second family and then Charisse who is the daughter of his first wife Laverne who does not know about the situation. It's a really interesting kind of slow burn story. It is not very plot heavy at all, it is very much about these characters and how this uh, dynamic in their family really impacted on their self-perceptions and particularly their relationships to men. Insecurity is a massive massive thing that is just seeping through every single chapter in this book. It's a really interesting commentary on how suffering is really really subjective and also how the narratives that you create about other people are almost never what their lived reality actually is. The second family of Gwen and Dana imagine that Charisse and Laverne kind of live in luxury because they are the chosen ones. Because they are the legitimate family they have all of these notions about how grand and stuck up they must be, how privileged their lives must be. However when we actually get into Charisse's perspective we see that that is not the case at all. And I feel just like with An American Marriage Tayari Jones really really shines at being able to write from different perspectives. She's really able to wrap you up in the different voices of these people and be able to hold them up simultaneously without it feeling like a strain or like you're having to do mental gymnastics to accept what both of these people are saying at the same time. It's really easy to look at a situation like this and say this person is to blame, this is the good guy, this is the bad guy. However she really shines a light on how it's never really that simple. I thought it was a really fantastic book. I think if you are looking for something that is very very plot heavy you're obviously not going to get it here um, but if you like character focused, family focused narratives then and I would highly recommend this. Also I wanted to highlight a particular line in this book because um, Charisse ends up going to this kind of performing arts school to play the flute, however she learns very very quickly that she is not that talented at the flute. And she has this kind of one throwaway paragraph where she kind of complains about the flute and for those of you who don't know um, I used to play the violin when I was in high school and if you have ever been in a high school orchestra I don't know how it is uh, when you get a little bit older and you mature out of these prejudices uh, but there was always a bit of a back and forth fight between the woodwind and the strings as to who was better over which was the most important section within the orchestra. Obviously it's the string section. And yet there was just this one paragraph where she complains about the flute which as a former violin player uh, I just really appreciated and it just brought me back to that old rivalry between strings and woodwind. <laughs> I thought about my flute and piccolo snug in their velvet lined case. I'd lost interest even before I discovered I wasn't any good at it. Blowing a flute could never get you anywhere. There was not one flautist in the whole world that anyone has ever heard of. Every boy that plays the trumpet dreams of being Miles Davis, but the flute is something you pick up because you couldn't think of anything better to do. <laughs> and I know that that is so petty but I just love that line so much. <laughs> September was also particularly notable because it was the month that I finally plucked up the courage to do my long-awaited reread of The Book Thief by Marcus Suzak. This was a reread that I did with Shah over at Thoroughly Enjoyed Books and I really enjoyed my experience of rereading this with her. Basically we had initially wanted to do this reread because both me and Shah had at some point said that 
The Book Thief was our favourite book of all time, but we had never reread it since the first time that we read it, which feels like a glaring omission to have never reread your supposed favourite book. But I think both of us were just a little bit scared, especially having heard like negative reviews from other booktubers that we really respect. We were both worried, I think, that if we reread it, we wouldn't like it as much, and then it would kind of dampen the initial read and initially loving it. However, I am so happy to say that I thoroughly enjoyed rereading this book. Whilst I don't know necessarily if this is going to be the favourite book of all time, I definitely think this still ranks there in like my top 10. I just enjoy this story so so much. For those of you who do not know the story, this takes place in Nazi Germany during World War II. It is narrated by a personification of death, but it largely follows the story of young Liesel Memminger, who ends up being adopted by a German family, the Hubermans, after her communist mother has to give her up. And Liesel is a character who, for some reason, despite the fact that she is illiterate and cannot read, seems to be very much drawn to books, and often is drawn to steal books. The first book that she steals being a gravedigger's handbook after her brother passes away. She actually does not know what this book is because she can't read the title, but she takes it anyway. She later takes another book from a Nazi book burning ceremony, and it just kind of escalates from there. I was also reading this for a second time, kind of trying to understand why it is that some people might not get on with this book. And I feel like the main thing that I've hit upon is that this is a much more slower paced book. It's a real slow burn book. So I can completely understand why some people might get like 100 pages in and end up DNFing it. Because once again, it is not a very plot heavy book. It is much more of a character focused story, which is not everybody's cup of tea. Some people want plot, some people want a faster pace, and you are not going to get it from here. However, for myself, I like slower paced character focused books. And I particularly love books that are set in World War II. And also I've been quite fascinated by the personification of death. So this book really, really called to me when I was 18. But also reading it at age 25, I think there are other things that I've picked out from this, which I didn't the first time. Particularly the commentary on stealing and why it is that people steal and how stealing for people is often a way of trying to take power back that has been taken from them. Really questioning this idea of who in society are the real thieves. Is it these lower class people who have had everything taken away from them? Or is it the wealthy and the privileged who expect the lower classes to do all of this work and make all of these sacrifices, but are never actually justly rewarded for it? It's a book really exploring what you can make out of having very little. It's a book about imagination and the power of words. It's a book about what it means to be free and what it means to have the privilege of writing your own story. And yeah, I love it. I still do. It's a great book. I really highly recommend that you read it if you haven't already. Lastly, as I mentioned in my Cozy Autumn book tag, I ended up reading a couple of Pride and Prejudice retellings this month. I read Long Vaughn by Joe Baker and Charlotte by Helen Moffat. And unfortunately, it was a bit of a mixed bag here, in which one of them I really enjoyed and the other, uh, let's just say we've had the first one star off the channel. E I feel like so we can end on a bit of a positive note, I should maybe get the one star out of the way. And um, yeah, I know that this is going to be an unpopular opinion because I know a lot of people like this book, but I really disliked Long Vaughn by Joe Baker. Oh! I'm sorry, I know so many people love this. And I think the reason I was tempted to pick this up was because I had seen quite a few people talking about it, particularly in their mid-year favourites videos. I know Lauren from Lauren and the Books. I know Katie from Books and Things absolutely love this book. But I had, I, I had issues with it, man. So the premise of this book is that it is Pride and Prejudice told from the perspectives of the servants at Longbourn House. It's kind of got this Downton Abbey upstairs versus downstairs kind of theme running through, where the selling point of this book is really to remind people that the Regency period is not just this lovely, glamorous, glossy, dainty uh, time of gentility and manners, that there are a lot of people in this time period, particularly the working class, who are not having such a great time of it. That behind this glamorous veneer, of the Regency time period, there is often people behind the scenes who are working very, very hard to keep this going and they are not having fun at all. Kind of the analogy of the beautiful, graceful swan gliding across a lake, but underneath you can see their feet going like, Ugh. that I think is really the core of what this book is trying to get at. However, I felt like it got that across in the first chapter and that, that was all that was needed to get that story across. In fact, I would say that you get that entire point across from one sentence, the sentence at the back of the book, which is, if Elizabeth Bennet had the washing of her own petticoats, Sarah thought, she would be more careful not to tramp through muddy fields. Like, you've got that. You've got the entire 
idea and the whole premise behind this story in that. I feel like if you wanted to really successfully get this point across, um, Joe Baker could have done this in a short story, really. Instead, what ends up happening is you get, like, just another Regency romance simmering in the background. Meanwhile, Joe Baker proceeds to tear down pretty much every single character in Pride and Prejudice, because I would argue that the characters that appear in this book are not the characters that we know and love from Pride and Prejudice. They are simplified, and in some cases just completely distorted, twisted versions of those people that we know and love. Mr. Bennett is no longer, you know, sarcastic, but ultimately good-hearted. He is almost like a downright villain in this. Mrs. Bennett gets no chance to have any shades of grey, she is just completely completely like this insensitive, hysterical woman. Mr. Darcy becomes yet another rich, pompous man who thinks that he can buy his way out of everything. Jane Bennett is just nice and that's it, that is all we get. There is no element of her having like this deeper hidden layer that people don't necessarily see when they first meet her. You know, that deeper hidden heart that we know from the original Pride and Prejudice that Jane has, that is nowhere to be seen in this book. She is literally just nice and that's it. And Lizzie, once she marries Mr. Darcy in this book, I. I don't know what was happening here, but she becomes suddenly completely image conscious and insensitive to anybody who is not her. And I was just like, what, what are you doing? What are you doing with Lizzie Bennet? The characterization of the original Pride and Prejudice characters in here made me really, really miss The Other Bennet Sister by Janice Hadlow, which you all know that I read and loved earlier this year. When you read The Other Bennet Sister, which is Pride and Prejudice told from the perspective of Mary Bennet, the different perspective adds different layers, yes, to these characters that we know and love from Pride and Prejudice, but it doesn't fundamentally change them. What I loved about that book was that it exposed some different layers to the character it exposed different flaws that maybe you wouldn't have seen from the original perspective, but it kept them the same. I felt like Janice Hadlow was very loving in her portrayal of these different characters, whereas this just seems determined to completely tear them down for whatever point the author is trying to make. And the main point seems to be that the upstairs folk don't really care much about the downstairs folk, but with no consideration about the original characters of Pride and Prejudice. I feel like this book was trying to make some interesting commentary, particularly on class, which class is there in Pride and Prejudice, but it is definitely, admittedly, very much a middle to upper class distinction theme that is going on here, where the working class is not really considered at all. You know, you read Pride and Prejudice and you see the Bennets complaining about their lot in life and how they are not as well off as others and how, you know, everybody's going to be really suffering once Mr. Bennett dies, but you're also thinking to yourself, yeah, but you have a servant and you have cooks and you have a whole staff of people who are there to look after you, so I don't think you have that much to complain about, really! Which is what this book is really trying to expose. I feel like this book also was trying to have very interesting commentary on where the wealth of these uh, more wealthy folk came from. You know, Joe Baker is trying to ask these very, very difficult questions. You know, you've, you've grown up loving these characters, but then to be confronted with the idea that maybe Mr. Bingley got his wealth from sugar, or at least his father got his wealth from sugar, which means he has ties to the slave trade. And how does that colour your interpretation of Mr. Bingley then, if you know that he got his wealth from exploitation of slaves? Once again, taking off this pretty shiny veneer and making you really have to interrogate who are these people exploiting in order to have the pretty dainty lives that they live? And I think this is a really interesting question to grapple with. However, I felt like it was very clumsily utilised. There were also just other issues that I took with this book, like the narrative will just jump from person to person. We are mainly meant to be seeing this book through the point of view of Sarah, but whenever Jo Baker decides that she wants to jump into somebody else's brain, she ends up doing it and it's like, um, do you not understand how perspectives and narration works? I felt this book also suffered from something that I complained about in my Why I Hate Some Historical Fiction video, which is that she likes to info dump a lot of things that are not relevant to the plot at all. I felt a lot of the time like Joe Baker was trying to cram every detail of Regency period that she possibly knew about into a book and it was just too much. The main character, Sarah, is initially characterised as being somebody who is very much like, I get on and do things, but she spends the entire book completely complaining about something or another, just inconsistent characterization, and um, a few plot points that I feel like I'm just gonna have to say them, I'm just gonna put a big spoiler warning over this right now, because there were some things that happened in this plot that just, oh, I didn't like it, I didn't like it at all. So, spoiler warning right now. So we find out in the course of this book that Mr. Bennett has a secret love child with Mrs. Hill. Why? Yeah, I hate, I hated that. 
hated it so much. Like, what, what did this add? Like, why have we suddenly turned Pride and Prejudice into a soap opera? There's a really gross section where Mr. Wickham ends up hitting on the 12 year old maid Polly. Like, we already know that Mr. Wickham is the absolute worst. Like, we didn't need this gratuitous, like, harassment scene. We then get introduced to the character of Tol Bingley, who is one of Mr. Bingley's footmen and is a former slave, who I will say is the best character in this. He is the most charming, he is the most interesting character. However, he gets completely dumped by the plot. He is mainly used as being the third part in a love triangle, but then gets unceremoniously dropped completely from the narrative for like 200 pages. He is basically just used as the main character Sarah's like sexual awakening because, you know, he's exotic and other and she finds him attractive for that. But then she ends up moving on to this other guy and being like, oh, well, guess that was nice, bye. And I didn't, I didn't love that. I didn't love it. And I felt like this book just tried to cram in too many themes, too many plots, too many different characters, but then didn't develop them at all. And it just, it didn't work for me. I, 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 I can kind of understand why some people respond to some aspects of this, but I, I don't get all the acclaim. I, I, bye. And then last but not least, the second Pride of Prejudice retelling that I read this month was Charlotte by Helen Moffat. As the title will suggest, this tells the story of Charlotte Lucas, who was Elizabeth Bennet's best friend, basically unraveling what happened to her after she married Mr. Collins. And we meet Charlotte actually about seven years after the events of the original story of Pride and Prejudice, in which we see Mr. Collins waking up Charlotte with the sad news that their only son, their youngest child, Tom, has died. These first sections in which Charlotte and Mr. Collins are grieving their only son are just heartbreaking to read. Once again, like Hamnet, is just a really interesting exploration of grief and loss. And seeing the ways in which this massive life event really makes Charlotte uh, engage and think about uh, how she came to the position that she is, which of course means that we are taking our minds back to the events of Pride and Prejudice and seeing them from her perspective. I thought it was really interesting to see the future of Charlotte Luke to see how her relationship with Mr. Collins developed and their family life and how they make a home with each other. But also seeing some of the regrets that she has and how they impact her grief as well. Also something that was quite an unexpected surprise was a focus on one particular character um, who I don't think any of the marketing mentioned that this character became much more prominent than she is in the original story Pride of Prejudice, but the character of Anne de Berg, who you might have forgotten uh, because she doesn't talk at all in Pride and Prejudice. This is the daughter of the grand Lady Catherine de Bourgh, her sickly daughter who is initially promised to Mr. Darcy, but who doesn't really get a look in at all in Pride and Prejudice. She really comes into her own in this story and be becomes a really fully formed character and a friend to Charlotte. And in fact, I was worried at some points that this book was going to just become her story and that she was going to be the most interesting, engaging character. However, the direction where this plot went meant that th this didn't end up happening, but it was still very, very interesting to see more of her character development and just get having a chance to see Anderberg speak. I will say though, I feel like the thing most people will be coming into this book for is being able to see Pride and Prejudice from Charlotte's perspective, which I would actually argue were the least interesting sections for me. As much as I love the story of Pride and Prejudice, I feel like it just kind of retreads the old story that we know. There aren't any big surprises by seeing it from Charlotte's perspective. I was expecting for there to be like a big grand reveal, like for example, maybe it was Charlotte who revealed to Lady Catherine, like her suspicions of Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth with having an attachment and that that was the thing that prompted her to go over to Longbourn to confront Elizabeth. But no, it's all pretty gentle and the story that we know just seeing it from somebody else's point of view. Which, you know, is all fine and good, but it's also like, I could just read Pride and Prejudice to get this story, why do I need it in here? One minor qualm that I had with this was that I didn't feel particularly seeing this from Charlotte's perspective really built Charlotte up that much as a character, as like a fully formed character with flaws. I would say, actually, Charlotte doesn't really seem to have any flaws in this. You know, she is kind, she is resourceful, she is hardworking, she's kind of long-suffering in many ways, and that's kind of fair. And I feel like, like I say, if there had been some grand reveal about Charlotte's deeper involvement 
moment in the story. Um, maybe that could have added a bit more of a, a, a flawed layer to her. But in this, um, she kind of just feels like a bit of a blank slate. And it felt in many ways like things were happening around her and it was more like the contrivances of other people that really kept the plot going. And it didn't make this book unenjoyable, I still liked reading it, but I felt less satisfied I think than I did with say the other Bennett sister. I'm also coming to the conclusion that uh, how much I like a Pride and Prejudice retelling is a direct correlation to how happy they allow Mr Darcy and Elizabeth to be. So in terms of how that goes I would say the ranking would be bottom Longbourn, then Charlotte, and then the other Bennett sister. Not to spoil things too much but you know. <laughs> But yeah, I would say that this was a very nice retelling of Pride and Prejudice. I'm really glad that I read it and I liked being in Charlotte's head a little bit more. I think especially if you have read The Other Bennet Sister, you'll probably know the character that I would say probably gets the most hard done by in terms of characterization is Charlotte Lucas. Um, so it's nice to see her get her due in some way. But yeah, I would just ultimately say it's a very nice story. You can see that there has been care and attention put into it, uh, but it's just not my absolute favourite. So yes, those are all of the books that I read in the second half of September. Do let me know what you thought of any of the books, do you agree, do you disagree, especially with Longbourn, um, and let me know what else you have been reading. I hope you are all having a fantastic, fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks!